Welcome to Knock Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsville, Texas, USA, with another episode of Controversial Issues with Rabbi Chaim Kaufman from the Holy Land. Welcome back, Rabbi. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us as usual. Welcome back. It's been, it's been a good few weeks. You've been without me, been on vacation. It's been, uh, you yep. know, I was sick, so it's uh, good to be back. We had a... Uh, Family Simcha, my daughter got engaged, but can't have the engagement party because one of my grandkids had Corona, so I got to push that off another week or so. But everything, uh, everything, hopefully back to normal. You know, good. getting hopefully getting some good rain. We need some rain here, but otherwise, uh, everything is good. Yeah, I think the weather there and the weather here are very similar right now. It's about fifty degrees here. Yeah, well, it's actually just cleared up. It was raining yesterday, but. Uh, Anyway. So we're supposed to get like in the 40s, get some nice uh, rain, some ice pellets and different things in the, later in the week. But uh, listen, we need rain. We had a whole month. We didn't have any rain. So, uh, you know, we get enough rain in one night. So, you know, for the whole month. So yep, true. hopefully we get some good rain, uh, you know, this week. And as I always say, got to learn how to walk between the drops, even though I always get soaking wet. So <laughs> <laughs> My never said to... I knew how to do it, but, uh, you know. My brother used to That's tell me I was, goes. I was so skinny growing up, I used to have to, <clears throat> have to run around in the shower to get wet. <laughs> now I don't have that problem, unfortunately. <laughs> so Just a on. little spritz, right? That's yeah, it. There, you Just, uh... there you go. Well, good deal. So uh, anti-Semitism and toxic families and how to deal with them. So this is it. It's a good topic. Take it away, Rabbi. Okay, again, pleasure to be here. Um, if the topic comes up, you know, it comes up quite a bit, and, you know, that is, how do you deal with family? How do you deal with family and friends, you know, in general? And how do you deal with them when they, you know, when they tell you you're going to find out forever, and they make fun of you, and whatever? So, we could get into the to the nitty-gritty technical aspect, you know, maybe speak a little bit about, you know, psychology, you know, etc., you know, without going down that track. You know, of how to deal with certain things. So one thing most of us would agree, especially, you know, people coming out of Christianity, they don't want to hear from someone else, you know, a Bible thumper. Yeah, you're going to find out forever. You got to believe in JC. You know, how can you not believe in whatever? But usually, usually 100% it's a waste of time, right? Because anyone who's ever dealt with the missionary knows they have certain lines they're going to say. No matter what you say, they're not going to answer. And they'll go on to the next topic. Right? I had you know, the biggest group of uh, Mormons outside of Salt Lake City happens to be in Santiago, Chile. Not exactly sure how, how they got there. But two guys knock at my door. I wouldn't say they were the brightest guys I ever met. And you know, they start going on and on you know, about JC and this and that. And in the end, every time I answer them and ask the question, they're like, wow, that's an interesting question. Went on to the next topic. You know, and after the third or fourth time, you know, finally said, I'm a little bit thick in the head. Why don't you guys have any answers? You know, I want some answers. So I said, you know, go back to wherever you're going to go back to. You know, get me some answers. But I gave them a blessing. I told them, you know, there's so many Christians don't know anything about their own religion. Don't waste your time on me. You know, you should go and educate them. They thought was, that was like, you know, the greatest blessing since sliced cheese. You know, but, you know, people can have in their family, they can have Bible thumpers, messianics, you know, whatever you want to call them. And they're annoying, right? They're, they definitely get under our skin. You know, when people say things, how can you believe in this? And they're being brainwashed. You know, you're being brainwashed, all these different things. So in general, you know, there are cases where people are going to say that, right? Christians are going to say all these things, you know, against you. And the question is, okay, you know, how is a person supposed to deal with that? You know, not only that, what about, you know, someone asked me this question a while ago. What about family members that are outright anti-Semites? You know, there are plenty of them, you know, plenty of them out there. Oh, you know, Ooh. you like the Jews? And they, they start throwing all these, you know, anti-Semitic, you know, epithets out there because that's what they believe. You know, that's what they hold. Now, the question, the question, the, really the subset question to that was, and this gets into a much bigger topic, and that is, what if it's a parent? What if the parent is an anti-Semite? What if the parent gives you a hard time? What about honoring parents? Right, it's one of the Ten Commandments. The person's got an obligation to honor their parents, respect them, or what if they're evil? So the difference of opinion among the commentators, if they're evil, whether I have an obligation, whether I have an obligation to respect them, to honor them, you know, etc. So honor, in such a case, I may not have an obligation. 
Meaning, I may not have the obligation to stand up for them when they walk in a room, you know, not, um, you know, contradict them, you know, etc. But at the bottom line is, even if they're evil, I still have an obligation. I cannot, you know, belittle them in front of others, right? I can't make fun of them. You know, I shouldn't, as a show of respect, I shouldn't interrupt them, right, when they talk. Now, at the same time, if someone says, you know, if a parent would say, you know, oh, this is wrong, you know, how can you believe in the Bible and it's this and it's that and it's the other thing, right? You're not allowed outrightly to say you're wrong. You know, you're mistaken. You missed the boat, so to speak. You're obligated to say, you're obligated to say, you know, I think that the Bible says differently. You know, I think, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu says like this. Or I think the prophet says like that. Now, if you say it in such a way, they're getting the picture, they're understanding that you disagree, right? And that you're saying basically that they're wrong, but you're doing it in a nice way. Now, a person may say, if they're evil, and they spit in God's face, and they don't care, and they do all these terrible things, and they say things against me, or whatever. So why don't I answer back? Why can't I just say whatever I want? Because you know what? The Torah has rules. You know, the, 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 you can say, well, you know, they're blaspheming against God. They're saying terrible things, etc. I should answer them. You're right. You're allowed to answer them. Right? But, take for you know, it almost doesn't matter what they've done. You still have to show a certain level of respect. Now, for some people, this is going to be very, very difficult. Why? We've turned our lives around. You know, we've taken JC out of our lives where, you know, we're striving to be the best, you know, JITs, the Jews in training, right? Or Noahides, or, you know, whatever, whichever path somebody's going, and people are sitting there and trampling on it. And they're making fun of it, you know, and they're, they're saying, oh, come on, you don't really believe this. Come on, you don't really think this, whatever. So you say, well, you know, I got a lot of proof. Are you interested in listening? No. Right? It's a, it's a moot point. You're not going to get anywhere because these people are not that open-minded. They may not claim to be open-minded. We know that you know we ourselves are not necessarily open-minded. We don't have to be open-minded. We believe that the Torah is true. We have proof. We've done this a number of times. Right? Shown proof for God. Shown proof why the Torah is true. Right? But they're not asking that question. You know, their questions are more of an agenda question. And when someone asks you an agenda question, which is really not a question at all, the answer is, oh. Or the answer is, okay. You're not, you know, they're not asking you a question. I had someone a while ago, and tell me their kids aren't Jewish. They may think they're Jewish. Their kids aren't Jewish. And they, and so I asked them, I said, well, who did the wedding? You know, so they said someone who became, you know, like a minister online, something like that. They're the one that did the wedding. You know, and the person said tongue-in-cheek, and they didn't even mention God at the ceremony. You know, my answer was, I said, okay. <laughs> they don't have to say God at the, you know, the ceremony. If they're non I didn't say this, but this is what I meant. You know, if they're non-Jews, they can live together. They don't need to get, you know, they don't need to get married. Common law marriage, right, for a Noahide, that works. You know, a person walks away, that's considered divorce. They don't have to mention God, they don't have to do anything. Right, the person's trying to get under my skin and says, ah, they didn't even mention God. Who the heck cares? As we would say in Boston. Doesn't matter. Totally irrelevant. You're not going to get under my skin. You know why you're not going to get under my skin? Because what you say doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Right? So we have to realize, even if people say toxic things, we have to realize these people are 100% insane. insane. They deserve to be locked up you know, in a, in a white coat, taken away for life. That's the way we should view them. Oh, but we're sensitive. We believe, you know, we believe 100% in what we do. We feel bad when God's name gets trashed around, you know, and all that. And it's true, right? A person can absolutely feel that, you know, and there's nothing wrong, you know, with feeling that at the same time who says I have to defend God over here. You know, so a person has to make a decision, whether it's a parent whether it's a sibling, whoever it is, we have to make a concrete decision. How much do we want these people in our lives? Now, it, it could be very harsh. I remember, you know, we had issues, you know, my kids were younger, and, you know, I went to my in-laws, and we made very clear guidelines, very clear guidelines. 
you know, you want to watch TV? Fine. You know, you can watch it, you know, in the bedroom, whatever. I don't want my kids watching TV. You know, there are certain things that we had to make certain guidelines. Were we popular? No. But that, that's what we did because we had an obligation to protect our kids. We set up guidelines. You know, we mentioned also at the very beginning, you know, either one of my sister-in-laws, they marry a non-Jew. We're not going. We're not going to the wedding. We made that clear. You know, and then when it happened, people were shocked. They're like, how come you can't go to the wedding? I'm like, what do you, I happened to be in the States at the time. So I said, what do you mean? We said at the beginning, how in the world can an Orthodox Jew, an Orthodox rabbi to boot, you know, go to a travesty of a mocker of a sham? You know, can't you find a leniency? Can't you find? No, it's forbidden. It's a, it, it's the single biggest problem destroying Judaism today. Uh, a friend of mine I went to yeshiva with once told me on a way back on a, on a flight, you know, back to Israel. He, so he said, I, you know, I went, I asked him what he was doing there. He said, I was at a wedding. I was at my sister's wedding. I said, oh, Mazel Tov. He said, no, really wasn't a Mazel Tov. He said it was, uh, you know, she married a non-Jew. So I asked him, I said, well, how could you go to the wedding? You know, how'd you end up going to the wedding? He said, well, everybody knew I was there under protest. So I said, oh, so you were dancing around eating your kosher food under protest. <laughs> you were there, say, you know, hanging around with people there, say, you know, under protest. Everybody understood that. Everyone understood that was clear. That's forbidden. You know, you're going to say, what about for the sake of peace of the family? What about it? What does that have to do with anything? And if a family said, you know, I want you to eat pig and I want you to eat shrimp and I want you to desecrate Shabbos, I have an obligation to listen to my family? Not at all, right? How do I know? Because the Torah tells me, the Torah tells me that I have an obligation to keep Shabbos, right? And after that, the, the Torah tells me I have to honor my parents. So what's the connection? Normally we say juxtaposition of verses, there's a connection. So what's the connection? The Rashi on the spot over there says, if a parent tells you, I want you to desecrate Shabbos, you don't listen to them, right? That's the connection. I right. Shabbos supersedes all mitzvahs, Right? Most important, right? One of the most important mitzvahs. Parents, you know, honoring parents are also important. But if they tell you that that's a great job, you don't listen to them. Right? So I'm going to say, but that's one of the Ten Commandments. Honoring your parents. Well, keeping job is also, you know, one of the Ten Commandments. So therefore, in that case, I don't have an obligation to listen to my parents. That's to be nice. You know, you can't just tell them off, so to speak. You have to show a little bit of respect. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that Torah comes first. That is the most important thing. And if people don't like it, like my Rebbe would say, hey, tell them to go eat kugel. They can go eat kugel. They don't like it. You know, I had someone tell me, you know, they were upset, you know, something I said or whatever. I said, listen, it's the truth. That's what God says. That's what the Torah says. You don't like it? It's the way it is. You know, find me a proof that it's not true. Right? Then I started egging them on. Come on, show me where it's not true. Don't just tell me, oh, I, I don't believe it. I'm not going to keep it. That's not an answer. Right? But you're not arguing with someone that's rational. Messianics, you know, Bible thumpers, they're not rational. They just keep throwing verse after verse after verse, telling you, oh, this is what it means, and that's what it means. You know, and then you show them where it's wrong. Oh, that's not what it means, and you're being blinded, and you're being this. Right? So so the point over here is, you're not going to get anywhere. Right? In most cases, they're not going to be open-minded. They're not going to look at information. You know, you really think that I look at Rabbi Singer stuff and Rabbi Skobak stuff? Of course not. They're not interested. They want to try and convince you. They want to try, quote unquote, they're going to brainwash you. The question is, how much of a connection should I have with such a person? Now, people will say, you know, people will say blood is thicker than water. I hate that expression. <laughs> You're right. Blood is thicker than water. You know what that means? That means family is the most important thing ever. Family is the most important thing. Why is that the most important thing? I mean, I understand why, right? But if you have certain values and your values are based in Torah 100% and there's no compromise, you know, then then if they're not either going to have respect for what you do, then you have to reevaluate. You have to reevaluate the situation. Someone once told me, they said, you know, when I come into your neighborhood, I'm going to dress any way I want. If I want to wear shorts, I wear shorts, I want to... I, you know, I wear whatever I want. So I told them, you know, with all due respect, would you go to the Western Wall in a tank top and shorts? Now that most people probably wouldn't do. They'd show a little bit of respect for the Western Wall. So I would tell them, so why is my community any different than the Western Wall? We have standards. Standards of how a person should dress. 
you know, you would uh, so I used an example. They didn't like this example. I thought it was a great example. I said if you would walk into a Japanese restaurant and they would tell you, you know, they would tell you to take off your shoes and you're gonna sit on pillows. You know, you're not sitting in boots. You're gonna you have to take off your shoes. You have to sit with you know sit sit on pillows. Now if they say I'm not doing that. I'm absolutely not doing that. If I'm not, so they say okay, you know, do that. No food. You're not gonna eat. Now, would a person ever question that? Never. Because they want to eat. <laughs> That's part of the whole atmosphere, right? Taking off your shoes, sitting on pillows, watching them cooking in front of you. It's all part of this, all part of the atmosphere. Fine. So when it comes to this, they say, oh, I don't believe it. You're right, but I do. Right? And we take it seriously. So if we take it seriously, why do you think you can just trample on it? Why do you think you can just make fun of it? You don't you don't think I have feeling? You know, you don't you don't think I have what to say. Right, etc. So what people do is they'll say, I'll, I'll do what I want. So a person is going to have to make a choice. They're going to have to make a choice at some point. I'm not saying everybody does. I'm not saying, you know, it could get that bad. Right. But if a person, you know, wait, you have children, you're educating children, you know, they come in and start saying all these things, you know, about JC and being more modern and being this. So, you know, you can tell them ahead of time, listen, there are certain things we're not going to talk about. You know, we don't talk about, right, at once, I had once someone open up a conversation, you know, about something, saw exactly where the conversation was going, I nipped it in the butt. I stopped it. And they and they started going on. I said, we're not having this conversation. We're not, you know, it was, whatever, it was a lewd conversation. I said, I'm not having this conversation in front of my kids. Even though my kids were older, it doesn't matter. Not something, A, not something I want to hear. And B, I don't want to discuss. I don't need it to be discussed. Right? So a person has to set ground rules. Now, even if you didn't set ground rules, and now, you know, you're holding in a different, you know, different stratosphere, so to speak. So you got to set ground rules. Right? And if they don't like it, and they say, I'll do what I want, and, you know, these are my grandkids, and blah, blah, blah. You have to say very nicely, you know, that's not going to happen. Right? You, you want to toe the line, you toe the line. You don't want to toe the line? You know, that's it. Yeah, You know, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, especially, you know, if a person, you know, let's say they do have a caring relationship. If you didn't have such a relationship, okay, it's no big deal. Because you're not really losing anything. But if a person had a close relationship or a closer relationship, and then all things go haywire, it's painful. Right? Totally painful. I know people that... You know, they became religious, they became Orthodox Jews, the parents disowned them. And I know a, a good friend of mine that that not only the parents disowned him, they didn't come to they didn't come to his wedding. You know, and his father never met his wife or his kids. Or his mother ended up, you know, one trip at least, you know, met uh, you know, his wife and his kids. But that's how far that's how far it can go. I'm not saying everybody's like that. Yeah, I know some families that they all became religious. You know, but a lot of times it's negative. You're the one who changed. You're the one who's gone against us. You're the one who's out there, you know, some fanatic in fanatical land, whatever, you know, whatever you're doing, you know, and, and they're the ones that are defensive right now. You're not, you know, let's say a person's not telling them what to do. You're not telling them, you know, necessarily how to behave or, or et cetera. You're living your life. But what's the problem when it comes to Jews, when it comes to Jews, they have that spark. They have that special spark that makes them a Jew. So just like by Haman. Mr. Haman himself in the book of Esther. Who was the only person who refused to bow down? Mordechai. Totally refused to bow down. Now, you have to understand, Haman was extremely powerful. Had a lot of money. right? He had a lot of sons that were dukes in different provinces. Consolidated a tremendous amount of power. One lone Jew that refuses to bow. Everybody else, he walks into a room. They're all on the floor. They're all on their knees. right? Everyone bows down. It was a new idol worship of the day. Mordecai says, I'm not bowing. So what does Haman do? Haman says, I'm not only going to kill him, I'm going to kill his entire people. Now let's understand. He's got a lot of power, fame. He's got all these things going for him. He's got a very wise wife, consolidated power. He's got everything going for him. This one Jew won't bow down. Now some people would say this guy's a nut. He's a fanatic. He lives, you know, he's old school, so to speak. Let it, let it go. He can't let it go. He can't let it go to the extent where he's going to destroy everybody. He's going to destroy the entire Jewish nation. right? Why can't he let it go? Because he knows what the truth is. 
He knows that he was a barber in a certain place for 22 years. He knows that he was really a slave to Mordecai. He knows what the truth is. So even if I don't say anything, and people say the way I dress, the way I act, and they're gonna and like someone once told me, I think when I was first married, I was first engaged, someone says I'm offended by the way you dress. I'm like, what's the problem with the way I dress? I said the only difference is I said I, you know, I wear a yarmulke on my head, I, I wear a hat and a jacket, and I wear scissors. That's the only difference. You know, that's the only major difference. I said, What's offensive? You know, I, so, so I said, let me ask you a question. If I would have shaved my head, you know, get a mohawk, right? For me, it'd be easy because I don't have that much hair. You know, get a mohawk. And I said, and I would sit on your roof. And I would, you know, strung my, you know, I'd play my guitar. And I'd sit there smoking weed on a daily basis. Would that bother you? Now, this is a successful, um, you know, doctor in a certain community. And I asked him, like, you know, I go, would that bother you? And the guy's thinking, he's thinking, he's thinking. I said, I don't get it. I said, I want to give good values to my family, live a moral life, this and that. You know, if I was smoking pot and had my head shaved, that wouldn't bother you? You know, what, what bothers people? What bothers people is what you represent. You don't have to say anything. You don't have to say one last thing. It's what you represent. So people make fun. People say things. So I'll ask you, so I'll ask the million dollar question. After a certain amount of time, you get tired. Person may get tired of the same, you know, the same stupid statements that people may make. You know, I had someone once tell me, they say, hey, if I if I breathe on your food, does that mean it's not kosher? Like, what do you answer to something that idiotic? So you know what I answered? I said, no, it's totally kosher. It just has bad breath on it. Next. <laughs> I'm like, what do you answer to that? Like, that's. You know, you're going to say, oh, what are you being so sensitive about? It's an obnoxious comment because you don't believe in cultures. You want to make fun of it. Oh, no, I really respect what you do. So why did you make such a statement? Right? So, you know, people need these things like they need another hole in their head. Right? So now, I wouldn't tell people in general, cut off ties, cut off relationship with family. Right? Someone wants to ask me that. They said, would you tell people to do that? I said, depends. Depends on the situation. But if someone's interfering, you know, with, with your education, right, your education of your kids, you know, and then your kids start to think and they open them up and this and that, that that's a problem, right? That you don't want, right? You certainly don't want. So a person has to make clear-cut boundaries. And if you don't make clear-cut boundaries, you know, these things can seep in. So therefore, I would say, okay, now, if somebody, somebody is anti-Semitic, right, somebody, even if it's a parent. Even if it's apparent, there, there's no myth for to sit there and take it. Who, who says you have an obligation? You know, you know, to take it, you can say, okay, you know, we can agree to disagree. And you move on. If they keep hammering the point and they keep saying things against and against and against, you know, then a person has to reevaluate. They, you know, you know, they can make fun of their spouse, they can, you know, say things for their kids. You know, and somebody once tell me, one of my kids. One of my kids over the age of uh, three, where they were like four, you know, four or five, you know, they had um, just eaten eaten meat and they wanted to drink milk. So they have to wait like an hour. We made them wait like a little bit. Someone says, how could you deprive a child like that? <laughs> how could you deprive a child? I said, you know why? Because the Torah says I have to. The Torah says I have an obligation to educate my kids and I have to separate them from transgressions. From eating milk and meat, right? So for a child, okay, you can wait 20 minutes, half an hour. You know, depending on the age, you wash out their mouth, different things. You know, whatever it is. But, you know, so when I was younger, I'd jump up and down, you know, and scream. I'm like, who are you? What are you saying? This, that. So there was very cool, common collect. I said, you know what? We believe in the Torah. We believe what God says. We believe you don't know how to eat milk and meat. So I have an obligation to educate my kids. This kid is, you know, is of, 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 of educational age. Right, the, let's say the age of five, the age of six. So I have to stop them from doing certain things. You know, have to educate. That's my obligation. Right, it's an obligation of a parent. Right, but what? How did they take it? They said, "Oh, your child's being deprived. What are they being deprived of? They're being taught discipline. That's what they're being taught. They're being taught that there's a God and He runs the world and He's in charge. Right, children at the age of ten. My youngest son is learning chapter two of Bava Mitzia. What does chapter 2 above Mitzia talk about? Talks about lost objects. Talks about what you do when you find a lost object. 
you know, do you, do you have to uh, put a sign up? Does it have a sign in and of itself? Maybe, maybe you know, there are a lot of bills on top of one of another. Maybe they're put in a circle. Maybe, you know, you know, does it look like it's left there? It's not left there. Whatever the case is, there there are cases where I've been allowed to take it. There are cases where I'm not allowed to touch it. There are cases where I have to put up signs. You know, I have to put up signs and say, you know, did anyone lose? You know, if anyone lost something in this area, you know, bring me some, bring me some signs that it belongs to them. Right? So you got to say, okay, why? Why? Why do they? Why do they? What's? Why is that the first part of Gemara that they learn? Because they have to learn that the world is not is not ownerless. Right? That there are repercussions. They have to they have to learn that there's no such thing as finders keepers. Right? Finders keepers is only if there's no sign, you know, the person already gave up on it, or whatever, you know, there there are different things where I'd be allowed to take it. Right? But the reality is first I have to check. Is there a name? Is there a sign? You know, is the place a sign? You know, many different factors involved. So kids are taught from the very beginning, the world doesn't belong to you, right? The world is not ownerless. Even though the mission St. Edwin says, Bishvili nivra olam. For me, the world was created, i.e. for me and no one else, right? That means that I'm my own world. We have the ability to build our own world, God forbid, to destroy our own world, you know, so to speak. But the world is not ownerless. There's a judge. There's judgment, right? That's going to go on. We're responsible. We are 100% responsible for our actions. Now, someone wants to try and uproot that. Someone wants to try and make fun of it. You know, someone wants to have us go against, you know, what we believe. You know, so we're going to stand up to that, right? But the question is, how far does that go? You know, does the person have to be, you know, a dishrag over here? They have to just, you know, take punishment to no end? You know, people say, come on, you're being too sensitive, this, that. But what happens, you know, there's a serious Torah prohibition of what we call onus davari. Onus davari means that a person makes someone makes fun of someone else, and they remind them of past deeds. For example, someone says to a convert, so, what would it like to be an orange? Right now, that may not be onus davari, but if they remind them of what they used to do, you know, don't you remember you used to do this, that, and the other thing? That's forbidden. You know, if they would tell a Baal Tshuva, someone who wasn't religious, became religious, and they tell them, hey, I remember you used to eat shrimp. I remember you used to be this, or you used to do that. I remember you before you were Jewish. That's forbidden. Right? That is a total prohibition. You know, the person can knock him on, I was only joking. Doesn't matter. Even if a person says they're only joking, right, the damage has been done. You know, maybe the person won't take it seriously, you know, whatever. But how do we look at these things? Right? So we mentioned before, the easiest way to deal with this is to look at it like these people are 100% insane. If somebody, you know, would say things to me, would push me around, and they were mentally challenged. Right? They had a 25 IQ. Now, it'll be a little bit annoying what they may do, what they may say, you know, etc. But am I really going to get upset? Why are you going to? Again, it may be annoying. But when you look at the person and you see their Down syndrome or you see they're suffering from other things, you know, you're going to have compassion on them. You're not going to take what they say seriously. Why not? Because they're not in their right mind. Now, you're going to say, come on, this person has a Ph.D., Right, so I heard two explanations of a PhD. A, you know, everyone knows what a BA is. An MA is more of it. A PhD is pilot higher and deeper. Or I heard someone explain a PhD is Papa has dough. <laughs> Papa has dough. Right. So, so someone who's got, you know, someone could have a PhD. They could have a hundred, you know, hundred and twenty IQ. They could be an absolute genius. But when they say things that don't make any sense, that are illogical. You know, you look at a Torah scholar like he's got a PhD. You know, you imagine, you know, you know, I, I would always imagine this never happened. I mean, it can't happen now because the person's dead. But imagine, you know, someone re- wrote, someone read an article on Wikipedia about physics. And then, he, you know, he writes this, this scathing letter against Stephen Hawking, right? The, the preeminent physicist of our day, right? And they write him a letter trying to say, oh, come on. 
You don't know anything you know about physics. You didn't read one article on Wikipedia. Is Stephen Hawking going to take you seriously? Never. Not at all. Right? But people throw out these things like, you know, it's unbelievable. They have like certain level of knowledge, you know, and they say, look, but Google said it. <laughs> Rabbi Dr. Google, you know, the, the, the rabbi of the generation. He's the one that said it. So who says you listen to Google? Right? So maybe Google does have a lot of information. You know, but but again, you know, we're going to get all offended. We're going to get hot, hot under the collar. And, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody else. You know, when I started off, I felt there was an obligation to answer people, you know, to say things, you know, give snappy answers. And sometimes I was successful. Most times, that wasn't the issue. They just want, you know, they just wanted to say things to say things. They weren't interested in the debate. They weren't interested in looking at information. They just want to get under your skin, right? That's all they want to do. They just want to make fun of you. They had a family member once say something very, very below the belt, very below the belt. So my wife and I answered him in 10 seconds, right? We gave him a snappy answer, and that was it. person never really confronted us again. Wow, you guys are tough. I'm like, what, are you kidding? You make such an obnoxious statement. You don't, you don't think we're going to have what to say? You don't think we're going to have what to answer. But again, you know, these, these are people not interested in answers. You know, they, they have agendas. When you have an agenda, it's just like in the Haggadah. In the Haggadah, there are four sons. There's a wise son, an, e an evil son, you know, sorry, a wicked son, a, a simple son, and one doesn't know how to ask. Now, the wise son and the evil son and the wicked son, they have similar questions. But the answer you give them is totally different. The one to the wise son, you give him an answer because he asked a question. He asked a legitimate question. But the evil, the, the wicked son also asked a similar question. Why does it say you blunt his teeth? You don't even give him an answer. And not only that, you say that had he been there in Egypt, he never would have been redeemed. Why? Why not at least give him an answer? Try and draw him closer. You know what the reason is? Because he didn't ask a question. He gave an agenda statement. He said, I think this. Okay. Yeah, but I really think this. You're not asking a question. If he's not asking a question, you can't give an answer. Right? It's an agenda. He's making a statement. And when someone makes a statement, your answer always should be, oh. Or you can say, okay. Because they're not asking anything. You know, and then if they say, well, if I would ask you this, and how would you respond? That's a question. But if they say, I think Judaism discriminates against women, what's the answer? Oh. I really think, you know, it's not fair. They can't be called to the Torah. They haven't asked a question. Right? They're making statements. They have an agenda. But if they would say, listen, if I were to ask you, you know, about, you know, women and Judaism and feminism and this and that, what would you say? Okay, that's already a question. But if they have an agenda, I can't answer an answer. Right? So now, it comes to family, you know, it comes to friends, you have to strip away the question. You have to see what they're getting at, what they're interested in, or not. If, they, you know, if someone says, well, where was God, you know, during the Holocaust? Oh, wow, i got a great book. It's called Hasidic Tales of the Holocaust. You want to read it? They go, no, it's just a question I ask rabbis, make them fidget. Okay, so I can watch the hair, I don't have my head grow. I'm like, come on, you know, if you want an answer... I can give you a serious answer, but no, I'm just asking a question to bug you. So when it comes to family and friends, who says I have to take that? Who says I have to listen to that? You're going to say, what do you mean? But it's your parent. You know, it's a mother. It's a father. Again, you're not allowed to belittle them. You're not allowed to degrade them, right? You, you have to show a certain level of respect, you know, but at the same time, who says I have to honor them? Who says they walk in a room, I have to stand up for them and this and that, right? But I'm not allowed to belittle them. I'm not allowed to make fun of them in public or, you know, maybe in private, you know, certainly as well. And it almost doesn't matter what they do, right? You have to show a certain level of respect. Other family members, I don't have the same obligation, right? It's only by a parent, right? It could be by an older brother also, right? An older sibling, you may have an obligation, you know, to show certain certain level of respect, okay? But, you know, there, there, there are parameters. There are parameters over here. So there's no mitzvah whatsoever for someone to be a dishrek. You know, not at all. A person has to make clear-cut boundaries. If they don't make clear-cut boundaries, they say, I don't care what this person says. Family's family. You know, I'll take it however they give it to me. You know, I'll give it back to them. They want to have a relationship like that. That's their choice. 
100% that's their choice. I don't think it's a good idea. Right? But people can do it, you know, if that's what they want to do. Okay? You know, if they're anti-Semitic, they say, you know, terrible things. You, you, you have to ask yourself, how important is this relationship? Right? And with some people, they'll say, well, you would tell people to cut off relationship. I said, it depends. It depends on the situation. I'm not a fan of it. I don't, I don't advocate it every single case. You know, it depends. You know, it depends on the situation. But if it's toxic, if it's toxic, nothing good is going to come out of it. It's only going to get you aggravated. Only going to make your blood pressure boil. Or, or you know, yeah, a person needs that like they need another head. So again, I learned this the hard way. You know, and, and you know, I bent over backwards many, many years, you know, trying to have relationships, develop relationships. And you know what? I came to the conclusion it's a very hard thing to deal with. You know, in general, especially when it comes to family or friends, you know, going down the wrong path, but there's no one to talk to. And if there's no one to talk to, then what do you do? Then the only thing, the only recourse you have is you have to let it go. You know, you have to move on because the more a person gets into Torah, they get into keeping mitzvahs, whether as a Jew, Jew in training or as a non-Jew, you're not going to have that much in common with others in general. Right, depending how much you integrate, depending, you know, it depends on a lot of different things, right? But you know, certainly for a Jew, that they're all in. It's all, you know, Judaism is all encompassing, right? So if it's all encompassing, you're not going to go to a bar with these people. You're not going to watch movies with them. You're probably not even going to watch football with them because that's not on your agenda anymore. You know, they're going to say, so what common ground do we have? It's a problem. There's very little common ground. So if there's very little common ground, you know, you still want to have some sort of relationship. So you'll talk about the weather. Maybe you'll talk about sports. Maybe you'll talk about other things. But that's it. It'll be very superficial, right? You cannot force someone to drink over here. They may have not want nothing to do with you or your life. You know what? And it's sad. There's a sad, you know, there, there's a sad reality, you know. And, you know, people will be told, listen, this relationship will go nowhere. 100%, it'll never go anywhere. And you may get dropped like a hot potato. You know, but you didn't necessarily do anything wrong over here. You know, you're doing what you need to do. You're doing what God told you to do. But guess what? There are repercussions. So let's say, you know, someone makes a birthday party in a country club, right? And all the food is not kosher. Now, let's say people know you're not going to eat there, but it's important for you to be there. Now, it could be in certain circumstances, maybe it's okay. To go to such a thing. Because people say, you know, family's so important. You know, blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, Torah is what you represent. Going into such a place, you know, people aren't going to say, wow, look what this person did. Look at all the self-sacrifice. Unbelievable how his rabbi taught him Torah. They're not looking at it that way. They're going to say you're obligated to come. It's a family function. What do I care where it is? So what if you can't eat there? It's, that's just your problem. You made a decision. You're right. You also made a decision. So why, why does it get under people's skin? Why is it you go to someone's house, you know, and people can do this as a test because this will be the litmus test. The litmus test is a Jew in training, you know, is going to keep kosher. They're going to start keeping kosher. So family has them for Thanksgiving. They go for Thanksgiving. They bring their own pots and pans. They cook their own food or they bring their own food. Don't think that sibling, parent, whoever is not going to be offended. They'll be offended. You used to be able to eat by us. You know, you used to eat this and you used to eat that. And now you're not even Jewish yet. And why are you keeping all these, you know, antiquated laws? You're separating yourself from the family. You're making, you know, that's where that's where it ends. That's, that's where it begins. That's where it ends. It happens. I know it's happened many times. Many, many times. So, if people are willing to live and let live, they're not going to say anything about what, what they do. Sorry, what you do. You know, you're not going to answer back to them. You're going to try and keep it par of, okay, right? Is that possible? Now, I'm not going to take a survey, right? Is it possible? I'm not saying it's not possible. But there has to be respect on the other side. If there's not respect on the other side, which in many cases there won't be because, you know, they're going to tell you you're going to find hell forever and all kinds of other things, so it's going to be a little bit more, a little more difficult. On the other hand, you can't show all that much respect for what they do because obviously you believe it's idolatry, right? You believe it's wrong and you believe they're going to pay the price, you know, and all that. 
So what's the best case scenario? Football, right? That's the best best case scenario. Talk about other things, right? If you don't talk about other things, and it only leads back to this, the relationship's over, right? You know, I'm a person. You know, I see things as white and you know white and black. I don't necessarily see things as gray, right? Because I don't believe the gray area really exists and it works. By some people, that might be the case. They say, listen, we have a relationship outside of religion. They don't say anything to me. I don't say anything to them. You know, Shalom al Yisrael. Okay? You know, peace into everybody. Does it always work that way? You know, people I've come in contact with, you know, over the years, you know, it doesn't work that way. Usually, at some point, there's some sort of break. There's some sort of split. And again, what is the litmus test? Right? It's kind of ironic. Food plays a major role over here. You know, you bring your own pots and pans, you don't eat in their house. You know, that that's it. That, that's where the line gets drawn. You know, so to speak. I'm not saying all the time. It's a very common thing. Very common thing. So, you know, if it gets nasty and the parents, you know, siblings are really anti-Semitic, I don't have to speak to them. I can speak to them a lot less, right? And if you're living at home, it's a lot more difficult. You know, you just have to ignore it because you're not going to answer them. Because anti-Semitism in general, without going into the whole topic of that, because you're never going to give me that much time, anti-Semitism doesn't make logical sense. It's never been logical. Because people say, you know, the Jews run, you know, Hollywood entertainment, you see in another country they don't do that, but there's still anti-Semitism. You say Jews have all the money, in another country that they're poor, there's still anti-Semitism, right? So, it's not logical. Ace of hates Yaakov. It's something anti-Semitism is going to exist until the Messiah comes. Now, it could be if there were more Noahides in the world, it could be the numbers in anti-Semitism will drop. That may be true, but it's not going to disappear. It's never going to disappear from the face of the map. That's not going to happen because it's going to be there till, you know, till the Messiah comes. Right? So that being the case, since it's not logical, and you have family members saying, you know, anti-Semitic things or whatever. So again, you have to rethink what your priorities are. You know, how valuable is this relationship? Now, a person, as we mentioned before, if a person had a more close relationship, this is painful. You know, this is very, very painful. And if they're not going to give in, if they're not going to stop saying certain things, you have to draw the line. You know, if they're able to overcome that, you know, whatever, and be civil, you know, okay. But that doesn't mean just because, quote unquote, blood is thicker than water, I have to have a relationship where I'm going to get slaughtered. Uh, you know, I, I don't have to do that, right? People can say what they want, sticks and stones, but it would it would save a lot of time, a lot of anguish, you know, etc. If a person, even if a person, you know, was made fun of and people said things, so again, person deserves to be in a straight jacket and sing sing because they're insane. You're going to say, wow, it's a big chip on your shoulder. Jews, you know, these Orthodox Jews, they always think they're right and this and that. You want to prove me wrong? Prove me wrong. Show me. Right? Show, show me where we're wrong. But the point is, I don't have to be open-minded. I have to do what God wants. I have to do what the Torah says. And you know what? There are a lot of times when we keep the Torah, it ticks people off. That's what it does. Right? These shows us do it. Right? But it ticks people off. They don't want to hear what they're doing is wrong. They don't want to hear, oh, kosher this, kosher that. They want to just do whatever they want. They want to be guiltless forever. Fine. Right? So I'm not saying anything. So why why do you have the gall to say something to me? Because I have a right. And I want to say this. And I want to say that. Okay. But that goes against what the Torah says. And this and that. And I don't care what the Torah says. So again, is that going to be beneficial for me? Right? This is what we always have to ask. You know, am I going in the right direction? Am I becoming closer to God? Am I going, God forbid, in the opposite direction? What does a person gain being in such a situation? Nothing. Very little. You know, it could be. It could be if a person has older parents and you have a connection to a sibling, no matter how bad the connection is, but you want to at least try and make sure they don't kill the parents later in life. So that might be a good reason to have some sort of relationship. Doesn't mean you have to love them, whatever, but you keep, you know, you keep in touch. Now, does that mean if something would happen, you could stop it? Not necessarily. Right? You have to fight to stop it, right, in general. But, you know, there could be ulterior motives why a person may do it for that reason. 
Could be other reasons. You know, it could be other reasons as well. But no one should ever feel, you know, family's family to the end. What happens when a Jewish family member intermarries? That's the end of their spiritual line. Right? According to you, according meaning according to us, you know, they're no longer Jewish. Repentance doesn't help over here. Every time they're intimate with their non-Jewish spouse, they're over to a prohibition. Right? They lose their status of being a Jew. There are certain things we can do. God forbid that a Jew can lose their status as being a Jew. Desecration of Shabbos in public is one of them. Unless you repent. Right? If you're in an intermarriage, that's very hard. Right? Unless, you know, your spouse is going to want to convert or whatever. That's going to be very hard to repent for. You know, if a, if a non-Jew is married to a Christian, right? It's not their fault that Christians are idolater. Doesn't mean you can't be married to them. Right? If they bring in idolater strings and they're bowing down to it in your house, and okay, that, you know, that that's a different issue. Right? That might be a different issue. Right? But in general, you know, that marriage does not have to be dissolved just because someone is going to be a Noahide, you know, and their spouse is going to be a Christian. Now, I'm not going to say that's an easy relationship. And how you deal with kids and all that, it's complicated. Right? It's a complicated issue. You know, but at the end of the day, people make the mistake and they think families end to end all things. And not true. Right? It's not true for one very simple reason. Because if they go against God and they do all these terrible things, I'm supposed to stay away from them. I'm not really supposed to have contact with them. Why? Because they're going to have a negative influence on me. Much more than I would probably have a positive influence on them. You know, there are reasons why to have some sort of relationship. But again, whatever relationship a person's going to have, they have to have certain boundaries. And if you don't have those boundaries, it's going to go haywire. And then it's going to affect you. It might affect your spouse. might affect your kids. You know, you might have to cut the biblical cord. No pun intended. You just, that's what you might have to do. Because there is no other way. You can, you know, and I've heard people say a number of times, you know, get off your pedestal, get off your high pedestal. We can agree to disagree. It's not about agreeing to disagree. Right? That's not what the issue is. You're not interested in a word I have to say. Now, that doesn't mean what I say isn't true. You just don't want to listen. Right? So if I start talking and you start screaming, go, blah, 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 you don't listen. Okay? That's your choice. That doesn't mean what I said isn't true. But a lot of people you may come in contact with, that's what they're going to do. They're not interested in what you have to say. At all. So you have to make a decision. And everyone has to make their own decision. Right? How far it's going to go. How far they're going to allow it to go. You know, and what their boundaries are. And if they set up certain boundaries. And the other side cannot uphold those boundaries. You know, you have an obligation to yourself, to your spouse, to your kids. That, that, that comes first. Educating them comes before any other relationship. Right? Even parental relationships. You know, so you tell your parents, you know, fine. You want, you know, you want to see your grandkids? I'm all for it. There are certain things that, you know, you know, we have certain, you know, boundaries. We have certain ground rules. You, you, you know, you hold by the ground rules. Not a problem. You know, and enjoy. You want to buck the system. Okay, then we have to reevaluate. And I think it'd be a terrible thing, you know, you know, for parents to say, well, you can't see grandparents. You know, I, I think it's a terrible thing, but, you know, if they're, if they're there trying to uproot what you're trying to do, then you know what? Grandma, grandpa, sorry. <laughs> you're just not going to talk to my kids that way. You're just, you know, they can say what they want. They can jump up and down, pomp and circumstance, all these different things. You know, it doesn't matter. I have an obligation as a parent to educate my kids to the best of my ability to uphold what the Torah says. You want to try and stuff shrimp down their throat, give them pork, other things, okay, you know, you have to draw the line. You you know, you, you cannot go past a certain thing. And that's it. And, you know, and it's harder in life once you've allowed certain things, you know, and then the parent or sibling or whatever comes back and said, come on, now you're changing? But after all this time, you used to do this and do that. You're right. Now I have more knowledge. You know, more, you know, more power to me. Get all this knowledge now. I'm not going to do that. So a person can answer, honestly, you know what? I didn't really know what I was doing before. And now I have a much better understanding and I don't want this anymore. I don't want this myself. I don't want this for my kids. Now, they may, you know, respect that up to a point. 
Right, but if they see you're serious and you're going to uphold it, it's long. You know, another important thing over here is a person has to show consistency. Now, I remember in my own journey, and someone called me out and they said, ah, you do this, but you don't do this. And, you know, you pick and choose. Now, my, my, the answer should have been, you're right. 100%, I pick and choose. I'm not at the level where I should be. You know, I should be at a higher level. I'm not there yet. That is an answer someone can hear. They can make fun of it. Right, but they'll respect it in the end because you're being honest. But if they, you know, if a person says, come on, what do you know? Have you ever learned before? You don't even know the Isle of Faith and you sit there and put them in their place. But really deep down, you know that they're right. Right, so, you know, we can also say we're not the world's greatest rabbinic scholars. There's a lot of things we don't know. You know what? You asked a great question. Let me give you an answer. You know, someone wants to ask you the question. You got a question about, you know, got a discussion about life after death. Right, short discussion. So I said, okay, give me the 30 second, give me a 30 second answer. <laughs> I said, you know, I'm good. I'm not necessarily that good. You know, 30 second answer, I'm going to send you a link to a video. Watch it. You know, you, you know, it's a two hour video. You know, you can watch it in, in uh, one and a half times. Right, so it'll take you an hour or less. I said, go through it. I said, I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to keep an answer about, you know, the, you know, the, the secrets of the universe in 10 seconds. Right, that, that's not going to happen. I understand. That's your attention span. <laughs> you don't have more than an attention span like that. Fine. Here's a link. You know, go watch it. Are there plenty of things I don't know? Yeah. A lot of things, you know, we don't know. Doesn't mean you don't deserve an answer. Doesn't mean there is no answer. Right? Sometimes the answer may be, you know what? You know, there is really no good answer. The answer we have is because God said so. You know, that's why we do it. There are many, there are many laws that don't make logical sense. Like the red heifer. Right, you know that uh, Kohen would take the ashes of this cow, this red cow, sprinkle it on someone that became uh, impure, and that per person becomes pure, and the Kohen becomes impure. Makes doesn't make sense, doesn't make logical sense. Right, one of the few things that King Solomon had, you know, difficulty truly understanding. Okay, there are certain things that we don't have answers for, right? And if we believe in the majority of the time, God knows what He's doing. And 70% of the Torah I can prove. The other 30%, if we don't understand it in 10 lifetimes, we may never understand. And we still have to keep it. Right? 100%, we still have to keep it. Right? So at the, end, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. We have to stand up for what the Torah says. They don't, people don't like it. They don't like it. Right? But if you, you can agree to disagree, but there's a limit. Right? There's an absolute limit, you know, to what a person can take, to what a person should take. You know, I don't believe people should be dishragged. Not at all. I think there should be respect, you know, so to speak. And if they can't be respect, you have to make a decision, right? You know, a person does not have to be in that type of relationship. You know, and I don't care. You know, it's a good thing we're recording this. You know, I don't care if it's a parent, it's a sibling, you know, whatever it is. If it's toxic, you get out. You know, what happens, God forbid, God forbid a person has cancer. What do you do? You burn it out of your system. That's what you do. You try the best of your ability. You take it out. You destroy it. Same thing over here. It's a little bit of a jump. <laughs> a little bit of a jump. But, you know, that's what it's like. Because you don't need that. People don't need that type of aggravation. If a person will do anything to keep the relationship going, that's their choice. And they make a clear-cut choice. Right? I'm not saying a, per you know, a person has to do that. And if they refuse to be respectful, see ya. <laughs> you know, that's it. You know. I, you know, I have a certain person, 20, more than I'm married, almost 30 years. I haven't been in contact. You know, told me off left and right. And I said, well, if you die before me, I'll say cottage for you. Right? I'll say the morning's prayer. Otherwise, they'll never hear from me. They're not interested in having a relationship, so what can I do? You know, try this, try that. They're not interested, okay? You know, that's not up to me anymore. I don't have a guilty conscience. They're not interested, right? So if someone's not interested, they could care less. So you have to make a decision. Right? A person has to absolutely make a decision, but there's no mitzvah. There's no mitzvah to be pushed around and to be bullied based on your beliefs, based on your lifestyle, whether they're family or not. See, I did that within a minute and a half. Hey, you did good, too. That was actually good timing. <laughs> well done, Mr. Rabbi Kaufman. Way to go. Mr. Rabbi Doctor. You know, I Mr. told my, Rabbi... my everyone, he said... 
he said he said he had a disagreement with doctors once 30 years ago 40 years ago and he goes and for that they agreed so they call me you know they call me dr sternbuch i said rabbi doctor and he goes no no there's the rabbi there's the doctor the thing two don't the two don't mix i go rabbi doctor goes i got it the first time oh my gosh that's hilarious <laughs> Well, good deal. All right, well, uh, guys, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. Uh, subscribe, hit the like button, and uh, turn on all notifications. You do have the options of three different options on notifications. You want to select all. So, uh, all right, well, that's going to wrap us up. Until same time, same place next week, Hashem willing, you guys have a great week. i got another show starting in about 15 minutes, so tune in. See you soon. Bye. Thank you, Rabbi. See you all soon.